Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 12th episode of A Kissa with Ishika, quintessential and inspiring stories of South Asian artists. My name is Ishika Muchal, and I'm coming to you from the land of the Tongva people, also known as Los Angeles, California. I am so excited to introduce to you my guest today, Snehal Desai, the producing artistic director of East West Players, which is the nation's premier Asian American theater company and one of the longest running theaters of color in the US and where I have had the honor of working these past few months. Sneha has worked as a freelance director across the United States and the UK. He has served as a resident director of Theater Emory, participated in the Lincoln Center Directors Labs and was a literary fellow with London's Royal Shakespeare Company. He is a member of the Asian Pacific American Media Coalition and on the boards of the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists and the Theater Communications Group. A Soros Fellow and a recipient of, the, of a TAN Award, sorry if I mispronounced that, um, this I was in the inaugural class of Theater Communication Group's TCG's SPARK Leadership Program. He was also the inaugural recipient of the Drama League's Classical Directing Fellowship. He was also featured in American theater magazines, 20 theater workers you should know. Snehal is on the faculty of USC's graduate program in arts and leadership, where he teaches a class called executive arts leadership. Snehal received a bachelor of arts degree in theater studies and political science from Emory University and a master of fine arts in directing from the Yale School of Drama. I am so honored to welcome Snehal to site. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Of course, of course. The honor is mine. Thanks for having me. Um, so let's start off from some of the basics. How did you find your passion for the arts? Um, I think it's always been there. It's, you know, just you find yourself in life kind of returning to things um, that, you know, that give you fulfillment and that give you joy or that intrigue you. Um, and theater is one of those things for me. It's something that, um, you know, I did in middle school, elementary school, high school, it said I was going to maybe do it in college. Uh, and then again, it felt it's something I kept coming back to. It's where I felt community. Um, and then it's also where I felt like I could affect change was, you know, through storytelling. Um, we can change representation, we can change visibility, we can change how people feel in terms of isolation and so um so yeah it, it's something that's been there uh it's also you know when you think about where you go to um when you're having those hard moments in your life right some people go to music some go to art um to fine arts you know others you know go for a run and so for me it's i've always found my home um uh, in theater mm -hmm. And so I was reading that you did your undergrad in political science and theater studies. So what made you decide to hone in and focus on directing? Yeah, um, you know, directing was something that I didn't come till till very late in my college career, till like my junior year. Um, I was in an undergrad theater studies program. And it, what's great about that is you have to take classes in all discipline. You can't just stick with acting, which is what I initially started to do. Um, and it was really when I took a directing class that things felt like they had clicked for me in terms of what I wanted to be doing and in terms of ways I could challenge the frustrations I had as an actor who was just constantly being, um, 
you know, I was constantly being asked to portray stereotypical representations of South Asians. Um, you know what I mean? Or there, I was being told that my opportunities were limited. Um, and so here, when you're a director, you, you know, when you're a director or a writer, you can envision a world and you get to create that world that you see in your mind. Um, and so for me, that's really where I felt engagement. And in terms of the poli sci aspect, you know, for me, uh, it's as I mentioned, I knew I wanted to affect change. And you can do that through government. You can do that through public policy. Um, and that is one way definitely to change people's lives. And to me, it was, um, it, you, have, it's, you have to do it in a different way. It's a very long-term way to affect change. Um, and for me, I was more interested in putting, creating stories where you can put faces and names to a cause or an issue. Um, because that's how we, you know, to me, I feel like, you have to touch the heart to affect the mind. Um, and and that's how we kind of in theater are frontline workers um, in terms of change. Yeah, I love that. You have to touch the heart to affect the mind, definitely. And like you were talking about how you had more freedom as a director to kind of address the issues that you had as an actor. So was that the impetus behind your one person show? And can you talk about what that process was like? Yeah, um, you know, my one person show came out of a frustration in uh, grad school, what I call the white Western canon, you know, so I studied theater in undergrad, and then I went to get an MFA in directing. And, you know, we studied these uh, great classical Western artists. Um, but to me, that just wasn't necessarily always my world or the stories that I was interested in telling. And I always think about, um, uh, I think it's a Toni Morrison quote, uh, about, you know, if there's, uh, it's either Tony or James Baldwin, so I apologize if I uh, attribute it wrong, but it's, if you don't see the stories you want to read, then write them, you know what I mean? And so for me, that's what a lot of folks were encouraging, is that if I wasn't seeing what I wanted, that I should start writing. Um, and so I did, and then, you know, the thing is, I was in a program in a school where there weren't very many South Asians in, a, you know, in our theater training program, and so it was one of those things where they were like, you know, these, mon these are great monologues and scenes. Um, there's not really anyone else to perform them, so if you want to tell them, it should probably be you. Um, and so, you know, what was great was that it, um, it definitely also pushed me as an artist, and I think it made me a director to be able to put myself in the shoes of my collaborator. So, you know, I now know what it's like to be a writer. I now know what it's like to be a uh, an actor. Um, you know, to, so to have to be in those shoes just makes you a better, stronger collaborator. So I was really happy to be pushed in those ways. Um, you also have to confront and be a different type of vulnerability. You know what I mean? When it's one thing to just write the stuff, it's another thing to actually perform it and to revisit that, that story night after night. Um, so that's kind of you know where that emerged from. And then the interesting thing is you never know where your artistic path is gonna take you. You, know, you can only set out on one, you know, you can set yourself on a journey or have goals, but it's gonna kind of take detours. Uh, and so for me, that was the interesting thing is I went to grad school from directing, um, but then out of school, I actually was getting, I was getting more exposure and more opportunities as a writer and as an actor for a little while mm -hmm. uh, before I was seen as a director. Wow. And you were saying how there's not, there were probably not many South Asians in your program, just like there are generally not that many South Asians going into the arts field. So what was the impetus behind going into arts administration for you? Yeah, I think it's similar to directing um, in that I don't know folks who, when they're growing up, um, you know, are like, I want to be an artistic director, right? Like, I think that's not something we necessarily know about um, as a goal. There might be folks, but for me, that was not something I envisioned for myself. And it was only as I started to, to work as a director to engage in the field, um, and I started to look for mentors and I asked, you know, people like, if you want to make a career, one of the things you need to do is find a mentor who can give you opportunity and support you and, and provide guidance. And, that, you know, I was like, great, how do I find a mentor? And they were like, well, people tend to, you know, mentor people who look like them. So find someone who looks like you doing what you want. Um, and so I did. Well, I started to look and I didn't see a lot of um, South Asian directors at, the, at that time or South Asian artistic directors. And the reality of it is folks are out there, right? You may not know them or your net, net, networks may not, they may not be in your networks initially, but they are out there. So I do think there is a critical mass right now of Asian 
um, and Asian American uh, artists coming out of grad programs, just working in general, and particularly South Asian artists. Um, and so, but for me initially, I ended up going to London uh, and to England quite a bit because there to be Indian is different, right? To be Indian in Great Britain um, is different, A, because there are, the Indian population has just assimilated in a different way and has a different concentration. Um, but also as soon as you open your mouth, you're viewed as an American first, right? Um, uh, or you're kind of typed as an American. And so to me, that was kind of a, a it, it was just kind of a, a refreshing, it was different, right? I was like, oh, if I talk to these people, they see me in this other way, versus in this country, it's oftentimes uh, how you, you know, how you represent yourself um, or how you look that your kind of assumptions are made. So, um, so yeah, so it was in that, and then it was the, the same thing with directing is that I wanted to create more opportunities for, uh, South Asian and Asian American artists, and that there were certain works I wanted to see done and to and um, programmed that I just wasn't, um, and so that kind of led me to uh, go into arts administration. And initially, you know, I was a lit manager at East West before I became uh, an artistic associate and then associate artistic director. So it was also about getting to know, particularly East West players from all aspects, you know, of the organization. Right, and. You're talking about stereotyping. So can you just touch on some of the <laughs> early struggles of your journey? Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing is there's a, sometimes there's limited vision that is presented to you. Um, and so folks can't necessarily, you know, they're not gonna necessarily give you the opportunities that you see for yourself. Um, and so when that doesn't happen, you have to create those opportunities, just like you're doing with this show. I think the show is, such a brilliant idea and it's so inspiring um and that's you know that's what you had set out to do and you created this own opportunity because you weren't seeing um indian stories or inspiring indian stories you know being told or out there uh in this digital space um and so i think that's what you continually have to do is see you know what you want to do and if you don't see that opportunity find like-minded folks and create that for yourself um and and see where it goes and and the thing is in this Particularly with digital, it's as we found in COVID, you don't know what your impact is because the, anyone can access the internet. So suddenly you can have folks halfway around the world watching your work or being inspired or people in, you know, in middle America. Um, because as we know, there are Indians um, and Indian Americans in every state in the country, oh, yeah. in big cities, <laughs> in small towns. And there isn't any East West players in every city or town. Um, and so I can only, you know, imagine, I mean, I grew up in a, in a very small town in Pennsylvania, so I know um, what it was like not to have access to community, but that is very, very different now. Um, and so those folks are out there and they're looking to, to hear stories like the folks that you're bringing on this show and to hear even your story, um, because that, it just keeps us all going, right? And it helps to fight that sense of isolation. Definitely. And did you ever, feel in any of your arts leadership roles that you had to fit in or that you had to maybe censor your vision to like not necessarily suit the larger goal but to 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 appetize to make it to make your ideas more appetizing well i think i mean every kind of always are going to have that struggle for yourself as an artist and i think the hardest thing is um staying true to your voice you know what i mean because there can be times where it's like I, I you know people don't understand it people aren't supporting it you know but it's it's your uniqueness is what's like gonna ultimately uh elevate you and be a part of your journey in terms of opportunities yes i think folks are limited in the vision i think when you're an actor a south asian actor you oftentimes are given very stereotypical roles as i mentioned or in my case since i looked younger they were like well we can cast you as the kid but if we cast you in this role uh then we need you know, we have to cast South Asian parents in that role. So it, it doesn't need to be a white family, but we don't know any other South Asian act, you know, so there just were constant, you know, a stream of excuses, if you will, yeah. um, versus, you know, saying, hey, this is what this family is. And, um, you know, it can be, the thing about theater or, you know, in TV and film is it's all imaginary, right? It's not actual real. So this kind of, this, you know, this want for, People won't believe that. Well, you know, it's people on this stage, you know what I mean? Telling a story that's made up. We, you know, and we'll go with it, right? Based on the power of the storytelling and the power of the artist. 
um, and their generosity. And so that's where I'm just, every time you hear things like that, you just are like, well, you're just not using your imagination or you have a very limited um, scope of which you're engaging. Um, and then I think there are folks that will try to whitewash what you're doing or tell you, you know, uh, tell you that things are too Indian or too ethnic or that's not necessary, but if it's necessary to you, you know what I mean, then it's important and you should keep it in as part of the story. Um, for sure. And I think all artists are going to, you know, East West Players is a culturally specific institution and I think a lot of artists sometimes feel like, um, you know, th that they can find their home at culturally specific institutions, but then there's these other things, which we call PWIs, predominantly white institutions, and there's a lot of code switching when they're suddenly in those spaces, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of how you act and how you behave, and uh, I think all of us at some point will, you know, be put in uncomfortable situations, which uh, oftentimes, yes, we'll make those bad decisions and reflect on them, and they will ultimately make you a better, stronger artist in person, but you know, I have written plays where it's a South Asian main character and the theater wanted to do a reading and they cast it with a white guy. And you know what I mean? And you're in that moment, you you let it happen. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, because you want that opportunity. You think these are people who maybe know um, better than you, but you have to, you know, kind of feel like, oh, I just compromised myself and the story. Um, but I won't do that again. Or you know, I've been given plays to direct where there are no, again, South Asian actors cast in the play, so they cast, you know, white actors or black actors, and that's them put on Indian accents, and um, kind of just have to stop those moments. Yeah. Um, and I think that's happening more and more. It's frequency and it's easier. I actually think academic settings are actually sometimes the worst. Um, because they're like, well, you know, we're a university, we're an educational system, it's okay. You know, they, they kind of have this, particularly this double standard where if it's an Indian or a South Asian or Asian American family, um, or even a Latino family, they may cast it, you know, multicultural. Um, but if it's a black family, they know that, you know, I'm not going to cast that black family in that August Wilson play with white actors or Asian American actors, you know what I mean? Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and as it should be, but I think that they folks um, sometimes don't hold uh, representation for other communities, indigenous communities, Asian American and Latino communities uh, to that same standard. And it's one of those things where if you don't have the people, find the money to hire those people or don't do that project at that time. You know what I mean? Work your way towards it. Definitely. And what we were saying about like how you can't imagine like a white parent with an Indian child, like there are mixed race families, like everything, everything exists. It's just a convenient way, I guess, of just saying this doesn't look convenient or this doesn't look appealing. Let's just get out of exactly. it. It's just the, the, the default is white, right? Right. Default people view neutral as what, you know what I mean? Um, versus, and, and it's one of those things where grow, you know, all of us, I, when I see a white family, I'm not like, oh, even though they're white, I relate to that. You know what I mean? You just follow, you fall into the story. And it's the same with, I think, you know, I think now we particularly see it with shows on Netflix, Never Have I Ever, all that kind of stuff that they're like, oh yeah, these are just, you know, this is just an, a family, right? They might be an Indian family, but they feel universal because it's specific and no one's like, oh, even though it's an Indian family, it feels like my white family. You know what I mean? I think we're beyond that thinking, or a lot of folks are. Some are not. Um, and we have to just get to that default as white mindset. Yeah. It's just yeah. people. It's just people and their stories. And there still is, I mean, not to go on a side tangent, but now there's also a conversation uh, about colorism, which I think is an important conversation also, because, um, you know, particularly as we know in Indian culture, you know, the uh, there are huge prejudices against um, uh, darker skin types and things like that. Yeah, that's a whole nother conversation for itself. Yeah. Yeah, so what drew you to East West Players? So um, I think there was a couple of different things. One, I realized that to me, one of the things that was important was the audience, you know, was the community or the audience that I was having a dialogue with, with, with my work. 
And um, I wasn't finding that audience or community in, say, a place like New York, right? I wasn't necessarily finding engagement that way. Um, and so I was feeling, I was loving the work when I was creating out, outside of, creating work outside New York, but not inside New York City. Um, and it, it was that, it was, I mean, it just, I was, uh, you know, when I first met Tim Dang, my predecessor, former artistic director of Eastwest Players, and he brought me to this venue, I had never, you know, being on the East Coast, I had not heard of East Coast Players, and I never imagined that there was an Asian American theater with its own space, right, um, that had this beautiful courtyard where people could gather, that was, you know, basically a community space and home for Asian American artists. Um, and it just felt right. Um, it's also at East West Players, we, you know, you fight the stereotype of the Asian American monolith, right? We know that, um, you know, Chinese American is different than, Asian, than South Asian or Indian versus Filipino. And we're able to break down and talk to tell those stories specifically right. um, versus kind of just like we're lucky if some of these large theaters program one Asian American play in a season, but, you know, they're not differentiating their mind between Vietnamese and Korean um, and Burmese in that. Uh, so it was that, it was that I could have a deeper level of conversation with our community. I didn't have to do a lot of explaining like you do sometimes when you're at uh, predominantly white institutions. So all of those things, I also think it just was a very warm, supportive community of artists that um, call East Coast Players Home, and I love that. Yeah. I'm a big fan, big fan of East Coast Players. Yeah, and like you were saying, the definitely the recognition of the diaspora and not putting it under just one label of Asian. Like Asian means a lot of different things to different people. So yeah. I really yeah. appreciate that as well. And it's even a base level, like even just explaining the difference between Asian and Asian American. Right? Yeah. Like folks don't even get that 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 is uh, there's there's a difference there because there are folks who you know what I mean uh, are born and raised here, and then there are folks who have immigrated here. Um, and the very different experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, what, can you describe what you do as producing artistic director? I know that's a very broad question, but. Yeah, I mean, I think on an overarching uh, basis, what I have been charged with um, is, and, and what I seek to do and to, to be a servant of is the, the vision for the organization, right? Um, and fulfilling of the mission of East West players is kind of my charge. Um, you know, and so it's setting out the long-term vision, it's season planning, picking what shows we do, but that's a very small portion as you know of what I do. And then otherwise it's also uh, overseeing day-to-day -day operations um, of all that we do at East West players, which is not only uh, main stage productions, but we have a very robust arts education program. We also do a lot of social justice work and advocacy. We do a lot of training and pipeline programs and professional enrichment for folks who want to go into um, theater, TV, or film. So, you know, there's a lot of different things that we do. Um, and it's kind of, you know, being overseeing all of that um, and trying to create it, make sure that we're holistically moving forward as an organization. Right. And one of the parts that I really love about East West Players is how they develop um, new work and really encourage like Asian American playwrights to have their work produced. So can you just talk about what the process is like of producing a new work and how Asian American artists tend to pitch their work to East West? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the other thing um, is that we oftentimes we're seen as a much larger organization than we are. I think we have um, huge impact. We do a lot, but as you know, it is a very small team of folks yes. um, putting in a lot, you know, doing a lot of that work. Um, and so it, it's, um, I think that is also uh, a part of the picture in terms of, um, how we go to that. I just lost the thread. What was your question again? <laughs> Going back in just developing new work and what that process yeah. like and pitching. So, yeah. so I, I think one of the hard, the, one of the things that we want East West players to be, and I hope is, is uh, accessible, right, to folks on all different levels, um, from whether you're an audience member, or a member of the community, to whether you're an artist. And, and I think that is, that's what <laughs> was connecting the thought. That is, I think, one of the things we want and we really strive for, but it is a challenge when you have such a small team as we do, right? So that right now, 
in terms of um, quote unquote artistic staff, you know, though I would put Andy, our director of production and casting in there, there's only, it's either just me and, or me and Andy, right? Who are doing kind of a lot of the um, artistic programmatic work. Um, and so, you know, folks can submit scripts. We do have an open submission process, um, but a lot of it is word of mouth through networks, right? It's, uh, you know, like the play we did, Man of God, came through the director, Jessica Prudencio, who read this play, who's someone I very much trust, who said, this is the best play I've read, you know, in a long time, read it. So it comes through all these different networks. It's word of mouth. I go and see a lot of work. We're part of a lot of networks, like uh, the National uh, NNPN National New Play Network and the uh, NAMP, which is the National Association, I think, of Musical Theater. Um, so those are all different ways that we do it. We do um, sometimes do a competition. I'm also on the board of Kata, and so when we do programming for the National Asian American Theater Conference, um, we also often, there's a lot of introduction to work there. Um, in terms of work development, it just varies. Um, I think it varies based on the timeline, what the artist wants, uh, what we can provide. Um, what we tend to do is that we tend to do a workshop of a piece that fits in a world premiere, um, or a play that even if it's been presented but it's getting developed further. Um, what we tend to do is a one to two week workshop, um, and then we'll leave a span of time. Sometimes it's a few months, sometimes it can be up to a year or longer uh, before we program into production, just because the production timeline is very tight, um, and so we want to hit the ground running by the time we get there. Um, and we find it's helpful just to have a little bit of time with the actors and the director and the writer in the room, um, and then for them to all go away before they come back and think about things. Great. And as a director, what do you personally and artistically look for in a piece that you choose to direct? Um, I mean, I think I'm looking for a variety of factors. I mean, as I mentioned, we are a very large, diverse, robust community in terms of the Asian and Asian American community. So part of it is whose stories haven't we told? Which community stories haven't we told uh, ever or in a while? Um, who are communities within the diaspora who have been marginalized or whose voices we have not heard? Um, or the same with individuals. And then I'm just looking for really great, innovative, strong storytelling. I'm looking for stories that are told in a theatrical way. You know, I'm not looking for something that could also be, you know, is a TV film pilot that's been adjusted or anything like that. I'm looking for something that is uh, originally, uh, is a theatrical work, um, is creative in those ways. And then oftentimes there is a social justice component, you know, actually not oftentimes, there is a social justice component, right? So. Uh, particularly now, what are the intersectional issues that are being spoken about, right? So it's not just about being, you know, first generation or from an immigrant family, but it's also about mental health. It's also about disability. It's also about uh, gender identity, sexual orientation. You know what I mean? Because all of us in our lives, we aren't, we, we live complex lives where we don't check off any one box and we don't prioritize, say, our uh, ethnicity or heritage over our religion or our gender or our sexual orientation, right? And so I want to create an inclusive space. Uh, but I do think that is also the forefront. We don't see a lot of intersectionality of issues and stories for communities of color. Definitely. I believe that intersectionality is the way to go for the future. So I'm really glad you are also speaking about the importance of that and how it needs to be more incorporated into communities of color and the work that we're producing that involves them. Because it's not just yeah. one issue. Like we all live lives like we are the main character in our own story. And that is not just a one single issue life. So yeah. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. And for anyone joining right now, just wanted to briefly say that this is a kissa with Ishika with Snehal Desai. And if you haven't already, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel so you get updated for the next Kissa, which will be announced at the end of today. Um, and so as your role, in your role as artistic, producing artistic director, a lot of what you do is finding stories to tell. So if you could tell the world one story or send out one message, what would it be? Um, that is such a great and challenging question. I think, you know, there's, I, I'm gonna 
pivot a little bit to, you know, the other thing is I'm looking for stories that feel relevant to this period of time that we're living in, um, you know, or, or have something to say to inform about our lives today. And so I think the interesting thing now coming out of the pandemic is stories centered around healing, right? I think there is, there has been a lot of grief. I think we can't even fathom, you know what I mean? And I think um, it's come in in just scale and ways that we can't even comprehend yet. So I think there is healing um, that needs to be done, both that's personal and interfamil uh, familial, but also um, across cultures, right? There has been a huge increase in anti-Asian hate and rhetoric and violence. We have become so mistrustful of each other, um, you know, because of the masks and all of that kind of stuff has, it's just become so much more complicated that we, um, I think healing needs to be center, central to kind of what comes next. Um, and then I also think, you know, particularly in this period that we need laughter, we need joy, we need comedy, um, that you can also, you know what I mean, um, create perspective and, uh, and affect change through laughter, right? Mm -hmm. um, because that's another way for us to get to, you know, we can look at situations with a little bit of distance uh, as we're laughing at them. But we're also think it's also getting us to think. Um, but we oftentimes can be sometimes dismissive of comedy or that form. Um, and I think coming out of the pandemic, we, I think those are the things I'm thinking about in terms of what are the stories to tell? Um, because I think it's it's a little bit of what we need, and I think they can all be combined. I love artists that uh, aren't working in any one form or genre, right? And they take us on an adventure with their work. Um, so I, I think that is central. And I, the other thing is, I'm very interested um, in what our Asian American dramaturgy is, right? So that if you look at, say, um, you know, uh, Lat uh, Lat uh, Latinx storytelling in America, oftentimes things like magic realism are associated or connected to that form. And I'm very interested in what the developing dramaturgy is for Asian American storytelling, particularly because we combine Eastern traditions, right, which oftentimes are more movement dance-driven based. Western is more text-based. Uh, and then we also tell storytelling in a circular way, which a lot of cultures do, versus Western, which is very linear. linear. So, you know, what are ways, what does that mean to tell be tell a story in a circular fashion? Which, you know, so many, um, you know, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, a lot of those ancient classical Indian texts are in that vein of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested in how, you know, how all of that evolves, but finds a uniquely Asian American aesthetic out of it. Definitely. And I've personally uh, heard a few of your panels and I know that you're at the forefront of many discussions regarding Asian American representation. So can you talk about some of the expectations and pressures that come along with it, but also what you enjoy about being in these conversations? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing I, um, Love is the opportunity to, uh, to, to, to have the conversations um, and to, you know, I, I think we, a lot of it is for change to happen. It's just like older generations need to give up space and room and power, right? To, to, to folks like you. Um, but uh, tied to all of that is the, is the kind of the burden of representation is I think something I hope um, artistically, uh, all of us, you know, can let go. Um, and I think that's happening, right? That you can only tell, whether you're a writer, a director, an actor, you can only tell that at that time, that one story, right, that you're in. Um, and that is one story and one experience. And it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to feel the weight of representation for an entire community or an entire country or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Um, and that as many people there are that is, that is there are stories. And I think getting folks to see that, oh, you know, we can live in a world where, um, you know, there are, again, I keep using never have I ever as a reference, but there is that story, but then there are, you know, um, I'm reading this, you know, so, there could be a story like that, but then we can also, they just did a Four Weddings update. I think they just did some other shows that uh, you get all these different things. You can see the nerdy Indian, you can see the sexy Indian, you, can, you know what I mean? Like you can right. fight in terms of what those story stereotypes are. But I think a lot of us feel that burden of representation. And I think that's one of the first things that we have to uh, kind of take off, you know, cast that off ourselves and off our peers. 
um, and know that you can only do, you're doing the best you can in that moment, you know what I mean? So I can only really speak for myself uh, and from my own experiences, and you are going to speak from your experiences, and they may be very different, and we may actually, uh, they may conflict, which I think is also great. And I actually think when they conflict, that's great because we're having different experiences right. versus all of us grew up, you know, feeling like, oh, I grew up in a small town. This is what my experience was. It was isolation. It was being only the only Indian person. It was being made fun of for these reasons, right? Uh, you know, I welcome having conversations with um, uh, South Asians or Indian Americans who didn't grow up and have that experience. That's wonderful. Definitely. I think that's so valuable that I've kind of been taking slowly from all of these kissas so far. I've always put that pressure on myself to like be the ambassador for Indian culture because a lot of people who are from minority backgrounds always feel like what they're doing or what they're saying or what they're consuming or what they're producing reflects an entire community. But it's really... Um, it lifts a lot of weight to hear that you really only need to represent yourself. And hopefully we get to the point where there are multiple places that we can look to see ourselves in. Exactly. And I think, you know, it is challenging because we are invisible pr professions. Um, but I also think, you know, the work that we remember, the work that we talk about is messy, is imperfect, right? And so I think that's the other challenge is we want to please, we want to do well, we want to create stuff that's good. But actually, when we think about work that affects our lives or affects change, you know, it is the stuff that is very raw, very vulnerable, very honest. Um, and that is really hard to do, right, as an artist and, and to put that stuff out there. Um, and so we, we need to support each other when, when those things are happening um, so that people continue to be open. Um, and even if it's not perfect, you know, it's a journey in terms of an evolution as an artist, right? Um, you're going to find your way. Not everything is going to hit in the same way. Um, or, you know, and I think a lot of the artistic relationships these days are transactional. You're only as good as your last hit or you're only existing at a certain venue while they're programming your work. And I think, you know, with COVID, we, we saw that in stark contrast, right? When we saw how many of our artists were just, you know, uh, unemployed so quickly uh, and without resources or backups. And so how can we also create a model where artists or at the center of our institution is something that I'm thinking a lot about and what that means and what that looks like. Yes. And building on that, what are some of the broader or small term changes that you would like to see occur in the theater industry and how do you think that we can get there? Um, I mean, I think, uh, as I mentioned, it is, uh, folks at the top, you know, who have been there for a very long time, moving on to the next stage of their career, which is, you know, it's one of those things where that's an issue we have here that you don't have, say, in Europe, um, or you don't have in England, because the folks as they move on are supported in various ways, right? They're both supported um, culturally and societally, you know, so there's a safety net of retirement, but they also are revered and they're also lifted up and they're given other opportunities versus here, it's sometimes you're an artistic director and then that's it. And if you're not an artistic director, you don't exist, right? Um, if you haven't found another path for yourself. So I think it, it's understandable that folks hold on in those ways because they, that is both their income, it is their families, health insurance is tied to it. There's a lot of things that change. But I, I do think, I mean, when you look at New York City, when you look at Southern California, the largest theaters in both, when you look at, if you just looking at New York and Los Angeles, the largest theaters in both cities uh, are all still run, you know, slowly, slowly changing by, by white people, right? It's not even diverse, like, it's, you know, there's some black leaders, but it's just white, right? And so those people are the gatekeepers to the stories that we hear and see. Um, and I do think that has to change. And that has to change more than just appointing a bunch of associate artistic directors that are people of color, right? Um, I think we also are living in a very hierarchical, um, colonialized model of being, right? Or the way our organizations are structured because that is the 501c3 or the nonprofit model is a hierarchy um, and it's a colonial model. And so I think the question is what, what are alternatives, right? What are alternatives? How can we create less of a 
hierarchical structure, we can create a flatter model. Is that possible? What does that look like? Uh, and not only does the organization have to shift, but also funding culture has to shift with that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so, but right now, you ha you know, it, it always astounds me that you, the people who are, you know, responsible ultimately for nonprofit organizations with fiduciary responsibility are the board of directors. And you can have a board of directors where not one of those people has worked at a theater or is a theater artist, right? Mm -hmm. Because got in because they're donors or whatever it is. But like, you don't run a hospital that way or a bank yeah. that way. So why do we run literally all of our nonprofits in this country that way, right? That those people um, are charged with the responsibility, that they are charged with being the leadership, or at least, you know what I mean? Uh, and they haven't worked, uh, you know, in those organizations or in that field necessarily. So I, I think it's just, we have things that are set up that we really have to question in those ways. Um, and I think with COVID, access is changing, right, to our work, to our organizations, um, and I hope that will continue. Yeah, I agree. I definitely think that the colonial hierarchy thing is something that can be worked on because it would be so much better if it was more horizontal, like you were saying, and linked rather than ranked. Exactly. We're so good. Exactly, and it's just a scarcity mindset, yeah. right, that we're all in. Um, and I know we also say, like, talk about an abundance mindset, but you have to imagine what that is, right? We have to get there. But right now, everything is in a capitalist, competitive, scarcity-minded system. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is really hard to move beyond and very entrenched. But it can happen. We just have to stay very vigilant and committed to it. Yes. <laughs> And looking to the future a little bit, um, I know that East West Players initiated this 51% preparedness plan. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so that was um, by uh, my predecessor, Tim Dang, um, who uh, really wanted to do something to shift the needle. And a lot of stuff with diversity is just start with by looking at your numbers, right? Like look at hard facts of, what your audience demographics are, who is on your stage, who works at your organization. And so he posited this 51% plan that um, that we called it the, the organization, the whole thing came under the umbrella of 2042 sea change, which mm -hmm. is when 2042 is when we're supposed to become a quote unquote majority, minority country, if you will, but I, we're just people of a global majority now, <laughs> which is a better way. Um, uh, but, um, and so he's, it out there as a charge that theaters, you know, say that they will do that in three to five years. Um, and we tied it also to a playwriting competition. So we wanted to introduce folks to new voices so they couldn't say they didn't know where the new plays were by Asian American artists um, uh, and some other things. And so that's where it, 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 you know, came from Tim and it kind of has uh, morphed into other things along the way. But, you know, I think we see it uh, it's happening in other fields, right? The other way that I think it's happening where, you know, we kind of was there for a few minutes and then died was in the um, writer's room asking to show your rooms, right? One of the things we don't see is pictures of writer's room, which are known to be predominantly white and male. Um, so there was a movement to for asking for pictures, people just to take a picture of their writer's room, which mm -hmm. a lot of it was met with silence because a lot of those rooms are not diverse. Um, but the ones that did share and that are diverse, we should lift up, right? And we should support those shows and those artists and those executive producers and showrunners. Um, but I think sometimes if you want to see change, you have to be able to track it. And it's both qualitative, yes, it should be you know, about the quality of change, but it also needs quantitative indicators to mark progress. Yeah. And what is your favorite part about working as producing artistic director at East West Players? Um, I mean, it, it changes day by day. I, I, mean, I just love when we actually have a show up and running in our theater and people are gathering in the courtyard and they're there and they're excited to see the work. And, um, you know, I feel like it's a story that is powerful or that hasn't been told or that we're representing a community well. Um, you know, those are the things that I really love. Um, one of my early things that maybe really opened my eyes about East West Players was when I, the first play I ever directed was a play called A Nice Indian Boy by Madhuri Shaker. And um, by, you know, we do a short preview process and then we go into a run. 
And, you know, going into the previews, after like the third day, there were like people that was like, wait, didn't you, you know, didn't you see the show already? Haven't you seen it? And they were like, yes, we loved it. And we came back and we brought friends. And, you know, to me, it's when folks do that, right? It, it, to me as an artist, when someone wants to revisit your work, that is so powerful and you know something's resonating. But when they want to both come back and they want to bring friends and family, uh, means that you're doing something right, right? That they're feeling, you know, that, they, that they're feeling impacted or it also shows how little oftentimes there are opportunities of representation for our community. Um, but I just love that and I don't know any other theater that I've ever worked at that has a community like that. And I feel like anytime we've had a show at East West that's really connected, you see folks come back two, three, four, you know, like next to normal, um, Allegiance, Mamma Mia, we have people coming back five, six, seven times to see the show um, and bringing folks every time or bringing their class. And I think that's, I just love that. Um, yeah. yeah. Definitely. I mean, I've only been working at East West Players for a little bit and it's all been remote, but I've still felt the community so much. So it's wonderful. It's and what advice would you have for aspiring artists and creatives like myself or anyone else watching, especially those of South Asian descent? I'm um, sorry, can you say that again? Yeah. Um, what advice would you have for young South Asian artists or just young artists in general? Yeah, I mean, uh, you're going to have to be patient. <laughs> you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to learn to deal with rejection. You're going to have to learn how to take criticism and understand who you trust, whose opinion you trust, and what your North Star is as an artist. Um, uh, everyone, you, you, you also have to go on your own journey. You can't, uh, everyone's going to kind of have their own path. So you may have peers who um, reach a certain point before you, but you know, it, it's everyone's going to, it's when the time is right for you, you know what I mean? You that moment will find you, and you'll find that moment. Um, and I think those are all key things to keep in mind. And then you know the other reality of it is it's very hard, right? You should, if you want to make it as an actor or writer, a director, um, you're going to need to have a side job or a backup job, or you're going to have to figure out right um, how to also uh, get by on a day-to-day -day basis in some ways. Um, and, you know, do that and then continue to do your work. And know, you know, one of those things is, um, you know, I just read this really great article about uh, being a mom and writing, you know, and this idea that, you know, a lot of white male writers have talked about, like, going away in the cabin in the woods and not having anyone disturb them for six months as they write their novel, whereas mothers are you know waking up at 4 a.m. or having to go and write in the bathroom or having to you know dictate their writing into their phone while they're driving their kids right um, and it, it just all of that shows how urgent and important the story is that they want to tell because they're creating that space amongst everything else um, and you should also do this work because you have something to say and because you find joy in it right um, you know I think we live in a time where celebrity is lifted up people who, you know, they're, they're celebrities uh, just because they have money, right? Because they have wealth is all that they are, or they have money and then they see stupid things on TV. Um, and so, but I don't think that's necessarily culture, if you will. Um, and so I think the other thing is, what is it that you want to say? Who do you want to speak to? Um, you know, what is the change that you want to affect? Are all things that will change over time, um, but you should know that for yourself, what it is. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely writing down on my to-do list, find my North Star of artistry. <laughs> yeah, and what drives you, right? What keeps you going? Because uh, there are going to be good days and bad days, and it's going to be hard. It's hard work, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so what is the thing? For me, the hardest thing right now in COVID is that after a hard day or a long day, uh, what I love more than anything is just going down to the theater and watching a rehearsal or running into actors in the hallway. And none of that is happening right now in our space, right? Um, and so I'm having to find other ways to feel connected to our artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes me emotional, thinking about how close yet how far we are from theater reopening.
But anyway, um, so the show is called A Kissa with Ishika, but Kissa means story. So I have to ask you, what is one influential Kissa or episode from your life? Yeah, um, you know, and I think it comes back to, uh, I, to me, one of the nights that I remember um, was when we did the musical Next to Normal. Um, at East West Players, which um, is a musical about mental health. And mental health is just something that is so taboo or put shoved under the rug in, in mm -hmm. Asian American, in many communities of color. So it's not just Indian, but definitely an Indian community, but also in the Asian, Asian American, um, Latinx community. And so, you know, to me, it was so important to do a play about uh, mental health and then to take this musical that was this Tony Award winning, Pulitzer Prize winning musical and to tell it with an Asian family at the center without changing any text or anything, um, but people seeing themselves, you know, and their stories up there. Um, and then just how, you know, the one of the conversations that I remember is both people coming back, but people also um, coming back. And one, one of the folks I talked to asked about, you know, they were like, I brought my mother. And, you know, afterwards they were like, I brought my mother because this is the stuff we haven't been able to talk about. And the story gives us something to start with. And for, you know, it makes my mother acknowledge what is happening in our family or has happened. Um, and to utilize this story to do that. And also for her, for, her, for you know, the um, woman who came and brought her mother, it was also a moment of catharsis, right? It was so, there was such a, she didn't know how much she was holding in um, until she, she had, you know, saw that. Um, uh, that family struggling with, you know, with uh, mental health issues and illness and figuring out how to talk about it, um, that it, it, it released something in her that she had kind of bottled up for so long. So, you know, I think a lot about that. I think a lot about also how we are invisible from the history and the story of this country, even though Asians, Asian Americans have been here since the founding. I think we don't talk a lot about how you know, First Nations indigenous people are called Indians, right? Because they thought that they looked the same as us and how Indians from India were brought over, you know, because uh, India was also a colony, right? And we were indentured servants um, to the British. So um, to me, I think that that knowing that history is gonna, is what will combat that sense of, uh, of not belonging, right? Not feeling like you have roots in this country um, or history or that, you know, uh, folks of our background and heritage have also contributed, uh, you know, to building up this country and what we have today. So I think the other thing is very powerful is when we, when um, we're able to do something um, and people, you know, particularly our touring unit for youth show, uh, when we're able to, you know, a, a student is able to name a prominent Asian American because nine times out of ten, you don't in yeah. K through twelve. It is very rare for you to learn the name of any Asian American who has made a contribution in this country. It's so rare for that to be studied or talked about. Um, and so, for us to be able to change that narrative, to me, is very powerful. Absolutely. Or to reframe. Yeah. And on that topic of history and kind of leaving um, a legacy, if you could define what you want your legacy to be, what would you want it to be? Such, such big questions. Um, you know, I, I think I'm still figuring that out. I mean, I think one of my legacies is to, um, uh, to make sure to, you know, we have a space for our community um, where they, again, as I said, can feel like they can bring their whole self in and be seen that they don't have to code switch, um, where there's an opportunity for Asian American artists to tell the stories that they want and to see feel like they are representing the community well. Um, and, and for me also, you know, a, a legacy of ensuring that, you know, I leave these players in a stronger position, in a strong position for the next generation of artists, which may mean also, a, you know, an evolution of our mission, because I think we have a very specific mission to give Asian American artists the opportunity to, to play roles or to tell stories or do things that they are traditionally not been able to do uh, and to have Asian American stories told by Asian Americans. Um, but I hope that that goal in some ways becomes obsolete over time, 
right? Mm -hmm. That it doesn't become so necessary still. But I think we are, it's, it's a very long, we still have a many, we have a few generations to go before that, um, you know, that happens. But I hope that there is a type of parity and access where, um, you know, at these with players, we continue to expand our tent in terms of inclusivity as we all become multicultural, multiracial households. Um, but, you know, those are some of the things I'm thinking about. And then for me, it's also about leaving a body of work um, that, you know, again, as I said, seeks to reshape and reframe the South Asian narrative. Definitely. And what are some of the, your current and upcoming projects and where can someone find your work? So um, they can go to eastwithplayers.org and they're on our social media. They can definitely see what we have coming up. We have two really great South Asian product projects. So um, we have the Satayana, which is a feminist modern retelling of the uh, Ramayana from Sita's point of view, uh, which you have seen and which I'm very, very proud of. Um, so folks should tune into that, which is virtual, but I think they can come to also, we have live streams where I think the live streams are really fun because it allows everyone to chat with the artists uh, after the show and also have a live chat during the show. Um, and then we are uh, uh, currently in Chicago, they're shooting um, uh, running, which has been written and performed by the actor Danny Pudi, which many folks may know from Mythic Quest or Community. So, um, you know, we just, it just turns out that in our virtual season, we have two really amazing South Asian shows. Um, Danny is himself Polish and Indian, which is such a unique, you know what I mean, um, uh, dynamic family, you know, background that he has. Um, so I think we want to, you know, ask folks to tune in for that. Um, and I think those are going to be really powerful pieces um, as we move forward. And then, yeah, I think, you know, we'll announce our season in October. I'm hoping to direct uh, one of the shows um, in the spring um, so folks can, you know, hopefully come join us in person in 2022. Yes, fingers, fingers crossed. And please go watch the Sitayana. I've seen all three versions. They're so very good. Please go watch. Um, yeah, and we have a question in the chat. Um, so I'm just gonna pull that up if you don't mind answering that. Uh, oh, it's cut off, but the question is, how difficult is it to tell or direct a story with an Asian LGBTQ character as a protagonist without hurting the retro sentiment of the same community in which the character resides? Yeah, I mean, um, and, and it, uh, forgive me if I'm interpreting this question wrong, but I think that the question is kind of if you want to tell a story, um, uh, but there may be, uh, well, here's the thing. Ultimately, storytelling is, is central to storytelling is conflict. So you're going to have to have folks, you know, and things that, that clash with each other that aren't in agreement. Um, and I think it's how you do it, right? I think it's it's the, the way you do it, because I think it's also okay to lay bare sentiments that um, are dated or don't work, are small-minded, um, and it, it's how you do that, right? I think um, is key. And then I think the other thing is if it's, of a, if it's particularly um, a sentiment that is not something echoed now, it's, it's making sure you make it clear that it's from a certain period, right, of time. So that, you know, the interesting thing for particularly Indian American households or Indian households is that our fam our parents came over, um, you know, and they came over in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And when they came over, they also brought their values from their generation with them and they kind of froze them and have been enshrined in them. And so there has been this thing where we actually see more conservatism amongst Indian Americans than we do with, say, our counterparts, like my cousins in India, right? Yeah. Um, because they have continued to, they are not holding, they, they aren't feeling the pressure of uh, being, uh, you know, the children of parents who have immigrated here and sacrificed so much to give us opportunities in this country. And so I think that is something that weighs heavily on us. Um, so I think you, you know, the other thing is when you're an actor, you are told never to judge your characters, right? You're told to find the truth of your character in the story because you're going to be asked to tell, to be a hero. And then oftentimes you might be able to, to, to 
be an antagonist, right? You're going to be a villain. And you can't judge or dismiss that character. You have to find the truth of that person and tell what their experience is. And they, you know, ultimately, they also have a journey just as a protagonist has this journey. And there's something to be learned by watching that story, which may be that they don't change like the protagonist, right? Um, they don't have reflection, which is something for us to see then and to observe. So um, I think if it, there is a, you know, a sentiment that is retro, I think, or old fashioned or outdated, it's, you know, it's communicating and understanding maybe how it came to be. It doesn't mean that it's, it's the right sentiment, but I think by contextualizing it, you're going to give it, you're going to add perspective and, and I think that's important. Yeah. Rather than just dismissing something out of it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like how in Never Have I Ever, even though mental health is in the South Asian community a taboo thing, like they're talking about it in this in the in the realm that it is taboo, yet trying to make it not taboo. So I guess that's kind of similar. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you uh, to who the person who asked that question. And thank you so much, Snehal, for joining me and just engaging in this conversation with me. And I, I know I learned a lot from speaking with you, and I can only hope that those who are watching did as well and can be inspired like I am. So thank you again thank you so much. Creating this space and then all your, that you're doing, and thank you for everyone who joined us tonight. So. Yes. And to everyone watching, please stay tuned. The next Kissa, uh, Kissa with Ishika will be on September 19th at 12 p.m. That's a Sunday. And that will be with Kavi Ramachandran mm -hmm. Ladnir, who is an actor, director, and producer, and also a singer. So stay tuned for that. And thank you again so much, Snehal. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Take care, stay safe, and I'll see you on the flip side. Thank you. Bye. Bye.